part of the reason that our lifespan, the maximum lifespan is 120 years is because maybe we've shut off certain, all of the critical genes by then and you just can't keep going. You know, the machinery is all shut down. So, so methylation is a way that, that, uh, that probably aging occurs just by general genome-wide methylation. Uh, and so these genes get shut down. Now, in most cases, it may look like aging, but, there's a, but there's, there are a couple of very specific cases where it's important. So it turns out there's two genes in all of our cells that, uh, that are housekeeping genes. And these are genes, so each time a cell divides, it makes some mistakes in terms of the DNA. Remember, you got 3.6 billion bases that you gotta make a copy of. And whoops, made a mistake here and you know, in this place, so I gotta, and there are enzymes that come in that scan the DNA and they fix them, they repair it. But if, you, but if, if that cell was dividing on the night that you, went to the, that you went to the gala and you had the third glass of wine and you know, whatever, and you made more mistakes than usual in that cell, well, there are a couple proteins that will scan it and say, whoops, too many mistakes here. It's, this one isn't worth fixing. And so they, they, they tell the cell it's time to suicide so that the cell undergoes genetically controlled suicide. It's called apoptosis. And, and it happens all the time. So we are constantly apoptosing cells. Cells are dying. And most of it is genetically controlled. And once again, as we age, the balance between new cell growth and apoptosis shifts. And we tend to more cells die than new cells that are being produced. And we'd love to do something about that. So uh, I'd love to have somebody do something about that. But, <laughs> um, but, but these, are, these are really fundamental biological processes. And these two genes that control, that give the signal that a cell should die if it's abnormal, one's called P53 and the other's called, called RB, stands for retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is a tumor in the eye. There's a reason we call it retinoblastoma gene. Okay. So, if you have genome-wide methylation and you start shutting down genes randomly, well, what do you think happens if you shut down P53 and RB? All of a sudden, you've lost the gatekeeper. You've lost these gatekeeper genes. And so when a cell accumulates mutations, rather than dying, it can survive. And we call those cancer cells. That's the, the, that's the beginning of cancer. It's when you accumulate mutations particularly in critical genes, and you can't, and, and the cells can't die. And so, so we now understand, this is kind of the most, probably the most exciting emerging concept of, of cancer uh, right now. And so many of you have heard me talk about targeted therapies. Targeted therapies uh, direct against a very specific mutation in a, in a cell, and the cancers will tend to go into remission but then they come right back. They come back after a period of time, eight months, 12 months, two years, but they come back. And probably the reason they come back is that the fundamental problem of this methylation problem across the genome is still there. And so now scientists are thinking about when you give a targeted therapy, perhaps we should give a second therapy that does something about this methylation problem and tries to demethylate it. And so there are, new, there are new strategies being developed around that. And, uh, and so this is called epigenetic therapy, of course. So, so the value of this, the main value of this talk this morning is when you hear people at, at your next dinner party talking about epigenetic, uh, epigenetic therapy, you know you're at the wrong dinner party. <laughs> but also you could say, oh, I know all about that. So. Um, uh, and so, but this is going to be something of the future, epigenetic therapy for cancer. And so we'll have targeted therapy and epigenetic therapy going on, and we probably won't do much of the old kind of cancer chemotherapy that made everyone's hair fall out, made them nauseated, and so on. So this will be a big advance. And if this works, it will give us the chance to cure, like advanced breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, brain tumors, things like this. These are the ones that we have great difficulty 
curing now. We can cure a, a childhood leukemia. 95% of childhood leukemia is now cured. And we now understand what causes the other 5%. There are some experimental drugs that, are, that have been used and those kids go into remission also, and we don't know how long they'll have a remission. But the advances are occurring, and they're occurring in the leukemias and the lymphomas the best. But these solid tumors, what is a fundamental problem is this epigenetic problem with solid tumors. So, so um, you know, stay tuned. Uh, I think this is gonna be pretty exciting. But this isn't where, the, that's the first story. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you the second, the second of the two stories. So, so if epigenetics controls our development and it, abnormalities there might lead to cancer, are there other conditions where epigenetics might have, might have an effect? Well, one of those that I think is really interesting is, are mood disorders, depression uh, in particular. So people said, why is it that depression, uh, when you get depressed, many people stay depressed for a long period of time. And, and yet they may not have been depressed at a time. And then they become depressed. And so how can one explain that? Well, the epigenetics people say, well, maybe you reprogram. Something's been reprogrammed. And, um, and so people have been looking in experimental model systems and said, what are the parts of the brain <clears throat> that control mood, that control uh, feelings? And, and by looking at those, if you look in, particularly in animal systems, it's hard to do these studies in, in humans. But if you look in animal systems, and there are animal systems models where animals get depressed, and it just, looks just like human depression. And when you look, what you see is that the chromatin in the brain, in those parts of the brain, that affect mood, they, they develop epigenetic changes. So this is pretty interesting. So if in fact, it's not just, you know, the chemistry, you know, the molecules bouncing around between, between neurons, but if in fact, the neurons themselves undergo some fundamental change that affects the kind of chemicals that they're producing, then that's a, that's a different way of thinking about this. And, so in these model systems, uh, these animals then are given, uh, you know, who, who are depressed are given antidepressants. And then they're studied. And what happens during the course of the antidepressants is that the chromatin in those parts of the brain change. And they revert back to the more typical or normal, what we would, might call normal pattern. And, and so if you think about depression, for those of you who, who know people who, who have been depressed or have been depressed and have taken these medicines, you know that you take the medicine and in three days it's not, you're not undepressed. It takes a long time to become undepressed. And in fact, sometimes uh, the, on the average it'll take 16 weeks. And, and when you look at these animal models, it takes a long time for these chromatin changes to finally occur in the brain, in these regions, for this epigenetic, for this epigenetic remodeling to occur. Now, most of us think about um, now drugs that we use for depression, but in fact, another form, another treatment of depression is electric shock therapy. And so you might say, okay, so what happens? Electric shock therapy and many people work, and, and, but if you give people electroshock therapy, it doesn't work in three days. In fact, people have multiple you know, episodes of this or multiple treatments, and, and it takes a while. After the treatment stopped, people continue to get better and better and better, and then finally, they, for those who have a good response. So these animals then are treated with electroshock therapy in the same way, and guess what? They have exactly the same chromatin changes that you get when you give chemicals. So what that says is that it, this is a fundamental, this is, you have two different ways of treating depression and you get to the same endpoint and it's an epigenetic change in the brain. So there's a lot of people who, who work in this area. I would say most people who work in this area are still working on conventional, the chemical parts. But those who know genetics are starting to understand that this may be a really interesting, interesting way of, 
of, of dealing with, with mood disorders. So there's a third story. And the third story has the biggest social implication as far as I'm concerned. So if you take, um, if you go in for surgery that involves your nose, um, you'll probably get the inside of your nose painted with cocaine. Okay? And cocaine's really great because it causes the blood vessels to constrict down and they don't bleed. So you can work basically in a bloodless environment. And so, so ENT surgeons d do this a lot. And, um, and so if you then, if you look in animal model systems and, and you paint the inside of a mouse's nose with cocaine, uh, they, uh, you, you'll get, uh, you don't get much behavioral change, but in the brain, you get changes in chromatin. So in, and it's the parts of the brain that control behavior and emotion. So it's a, it's a, and so when you look at, the, at, at that chromatin change, and then, so let's say you've now treated that mouse a couple times with cocaine, and then you stop. Well, those changes that occur in the brain reverse and they revert back to, uh, to what it was, what, we would, what I will use the normal state. So if on the other hand, you give that mouse cocaine and you do it for a month, and you look in the same areas, what you'll see are chromatin changes, epigenetic changes, but they're different than what you see if you only took it once or twice. And it's pretty dramatically different. And it's a kind of change that tends to get locked in. It's a more solid kind of change. And, and so, uh, so when humans then who take cocaine and who take it chronically, and it not just cocaine, but all kinds of addicting, addicting drugs, particularly narcotics, they develop these long-term chromatin changes in their brain. So one can say, just say no. Well, just say no works up front. But once someone has reorganized their brain, it's that they, their brain is working in a different way. They have you know, uh, addictive behavior. And, um, and so there are, there are scientists now who are saying, perhaps the solution to addiction isn't just you know uh, isn't environmental and rehab and going off and and, uh, and and removing yourselves from addiction because we know that people who have addictions that they can go a year or two and upon one exposure they're right back where they were and you know uh, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman is, is an example of this I mean and there are many many examples of, of people who have had this. And so maybe the way, the way we should think about addiction is different. Maybe we should really use, so some of the epigenetic therapies that we're developing for cancer, maybe we ought to use, use those for people who have chronic mood disorders or people who have addict, addiction disorders. So now I have one more story that's not really part of those first two stories. This is totally speculative, so, so I'm allowed to do that. So, um, and if you have slides, you, don't, you can speculate. You can, if you don't have slides, you can, you know, you can speculate anything because no one can hold you to it, see? So, so, but if you look at children that grow, grow up in toxic environments, and I don't mean chemical toxic environment, I'm talking about social toxic, toxic environments, we know that from a behavioral point of view, that for many years they have uh, evoked responses that are dramatically different. They respond to challenges much differently. They respond to loud noises much differently. They, they tend to, you know, they have much higher stress levels. And so what I think happens in, in children who grow up in toxic environments, socially toxic environments, uh, is that they probably rearrange their chromatin in certain parts of their brain in a way, and it makes it difficult for them to, to function in a socially acceptable and normal, normal way. And so if you could say what might be a way that could, you could help some of these children who are at the, or at the most extreme part of this might be epigenetic therapy. 
So the ca same kind of drugs that we're developing in, for cancer and for some of these others might be epigenetic therapy. So do we have any of these drugs? Have we ever used any of these drugs? Well, we're using them in cancer. Some of them are in clinical trials right now. But there is an interesting drug. There's a drug called valproic acid that's used to treat seizures. And it turns out that, that one of its effect is through epigenetic modification. And so people are now going back and looking at people who had seizures, who received valproic acid, who might have had some of these other social or other kinds of behavioral uh, you know, issues and to see if it, they actually got changed. So it may be that we'll learn something. Now valproic isn't the strongest epigenetic modifier, but it's, but it's one of them. So what I've tried to show you today is that I, th I believe, I personally believe, that epigenetics is, we are right at the front of that wave, that, it's, that our understanding of epigenetics is going to profoundly affect not just treatment of disease, but I think it will, also, it will also affect social, there will be social implications of all of these once we finally, once we finally work through all of this. So I, what I've tried to do today is to give you something that's kind of socially provocative to, to get you thinking of, of, about these issues and get to the, the way, and also to think about how our society thinks about these conditions, these diseases, and so on. So, uh, uh, so I'm gonna stop and open this up to any questions that you might have. Yes, Ron? These mutations are epigenetic, epigenetic, epigenetic changes. Right? Yeah, so we don't call the epigenetic, we don't call them mutations because the mutations are in the primary sequence of DNA. It's, it's, it's how the chromatin, yeah, so. Okay, so the epigenetics is something Right. Mm -hmm. But do these? Uh, so I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm talking about epigenetics or mutations. Though, so you correct me. Yeah. Anyway. But are these random events, or do they get triggered by certain things that, if we could figure out what they are, we could turn those on? Yeah. So, so there's pr probably both. So genome-wide uh, methylation that occurs as we age is probably there's probably some semi-randomness to it, and that we don't really fully understand it. But if you look at the amount of methylation that occurs <clears throat> as we get older, it continues to climb. And it just continues to climb. And if you methylate a, a cytosine at a certain critical gene, that gene gets turned off. And only in that cell though, not in every cell in the body, only in that cell. But if that happens to be like a stem cell, well then that stem cell might be the one that emerges into a cancer. So, so there's, so there's a random part. Now, the issue of, of the non-random part. So what do we know about people who have depression, for example? They can be sailing along, doing great, and they wake up one morning and they're depressed. And, they, and you ask them, what happened yesterday? And they I don't know what happened yesterday. What happened this week? I don't know what happened. I don't know, there was nothing that I know about. So, so sometimes depression just, it starts. Now we don't know what, what that was, but there was probably something. There was probably something that triggered it. And we know that in certain cases, we know that the loss of a loved one or a, you know, a huge traumatic stress can trigger depression. And, and we tend to call that situational depression. But situational depression in the right, you know, in, in a person who has and maybe a tendency for depression can drive them into a deep depression that, that, can, that can be, you know, like semi-permanent until something interrupts it. And, uh, and so, so at Wistar, we, we, we tend to think we study basic things. We just study, you know, we, st we try to understand the world. And, uh, <clears throat> and one of our scientists, um, uh, 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 Kazuko Nishikura, she's absolutely brilliant. She, um, she thinks thoughts that other people haven't thought yet. And, um, and so there's a principle uh, that we've lived with for a long, long time. The person, the person who developed this principle, his name was Beadle, B-E-A-D-L-E. And, and he proposed, and you might have heard this word, one gene, one protein. In other words, a gene makes a protein. And, that, and so the primary sequence of that gene determines the primary sequence. Well, Nishikuro started thinking about this 
and discovered that a gene makes a protein by making an intermediary called an RNA. So DNA makes an RNA and the RNA guides the direction of a protein, okay? So what she discovered is that a gene can make an RNA and the RNA can get edited. You say, wait a minute, that's unfair. There's something, <laughs> that's not the way it's supposed to work. But in fact, she discovered that process of gene editing. And, um, and so then the protein that you make, maybe you only edit part of your genes. So some of the times it's this protein, we would call that protein A, or sometimes it's A prime. So does this have any reality in the real world? Well, it turns out that one of the proteins that's edited, in one of the genes that's edited, is the serotonin receptor. The serotonin receptor is really an interesting, interesting molecule because many of the antidepressant drugs work on the serotonin, on serotonin and serotonin uh, receptor. And so what she discovered is, if she modified, <clears throat> she said, I'm gonna make two mice. One mouse makes the, the wild type, what I will call wild type or the typical or normal serotonin receptor. That's all it can do. And I'm gonna fix it so that it can't, it can't edit anything. And then I'm gonna take another mouse and I'm gonna say, what happens if I, if I make it so that it only creates the edited version? So she made these two mice. And it turns out that the, one, the normal mouse looks like a normal mouse, you know. It, uh, but the other mouse uh, uh, is trembly, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it has low weight, has a, and it has a lot of behavioral issues around it. And so this, so this demonstrated that the edited version of the serotonin receptor behaves, has a profound effect on, on. So then she asked the question, well, in, could that happen in humans? Could we, you know, could, do you ever get your serotonin receptor edited? And, um, you know, some people try to do that on Saturday night, and, you know, but, <clears throat> but um, do you ever get your, you know, and so the answer is that under stressful environments, these editing enzymes get turned on. And so maybe this is an adaptive, an adaptive mechanism that we've all developed. And so maybe when we get stressed, we turn on these editing and it gives us a chance to have greater, adapt greater adaptability to whatever's going on in the environment. And it may not be like logical, it may be just, okay, we're gonna make some of you run faster and some of you, you know, be stronger, <laughs> you know, and that way you can fight the, you know, the bear or whatever it is, you know. And, uh, but this issue of stress and causing, and that's another type of epigenetics. So I've only told you a couple types, because I, I don't want to tell you all the types of epigenetics, but it's changes that go on. So you can see this process is really complex. So in this regard, that, that's probably an evoked, uh, you know, a characteristic choreographed evoked response to a certain type of stress. So hope that answers your question. So this is, uh, this is another really interesting, interesting thing. And uh, so uh, there are some uh, observations that were made for a period of time in that women that were exposed to certain kinds of chemicals or drugs, there was a higher incidence of disease in their granddaughters. Not their daughters, but their granddaughters. And so, so now we understand this a lot better. And so many of these are uh, like a hormonal, particularly estrogenic compounds. Now we tend to think of estrogenic compounds as these are hormones that you can buy in a store and so on. But in fact, in plastics and in many other things, there are many chemicals that look like estrogens and can actually function like estrogens and uh, have mild estrogenic effects. And there are many people who believe that the increase that we've seen in breast cancer over the years is really due to these estrogenic-like compounds that are in our environment. And, uh, and why, you know, why eight-year-old girls walk around looking like, you know, like 17-year-old women, you know, and, uh, and, you know, why they mature so much er earlier. And we, and we see all of those changes. There's probably also issues involving fat in the, in, in the environment. And so 
young women who have increased body weight, they convert estrogen to testosterone much better. Than the, and so they get a big testosterone surge earlier, early on. So, so these are kind of things, but, what's, but what we know now is that grandmothers that are exposed to certain chemicals, particularly estrogens, but also smoking, that these induce epigenetic changes that are, that are conveyed all the way through to the granddaughter. And so grandmothers who smoke, granddaughters have increased lung cancer, even though they don't smoke. So, and so these, so, you know, these, so the social implications of these kind of discoveries are really profound and just is so engaging and so interesting. And, um, uh, and so the, and it turns out that it's not just those two, there are just many, many examples now of transgenerational effects of something that happened to someone. So the therapies that you're just beginning to create mitigate these changes or do they correct it? Well, that, well, so the change, the, so the therapies that are, that are being developed right now, they're global. They're not like targeted, but it may be that it's worth, you know, in certain cases where we, where the risk is the greatest, you know, giving these in a global effect. Now, what we don't know is if you, you know, you're an engineer or you're a space, you know, you're a rocket scientist and you take epigenetic drugs and you say, oh man, all that calculus I learned, it's now all gone. You know, we don't really know what the full effect is because, you know, we are who we are now because we've been, we've modified, we've been modified for, you know, years and years and years and years. And we don't know how much of that is genetic and how much of it is epigenetic, but clearly there's the epigenetic part is a strong part. But, but you can say that if you have cancer and you're gonna die, it's, worth, it's probably worth taking the risk. If you start looking at these other things, if you start looking at people who have mood disorders or people who have addiction, you know, we have to understand the implication of these, of these therapies. But if someone's on, the, on a course of self-destruction, because of either a mood disorder or because of addiction or something, then perhaps, perhaps there is some validity or value in, in uh, you know, some of these epigenetic therapies. And it may be that we'll eventually develop epigenetic therapies that are targeted for a certain thing. In other words, just targeted for those parts of the brain that where the mood disorders or addiction might be, might be occurring. So, yes. Do we have theoretical or actual mechanisms of targeted epigenetic therapy? Um, there's, yes, there are some. So um, um, probably the best um, and the most socially acceptable uh, epigenetic therapy is called resveratrol. Does any, have any of you ever taken resveratrol? Yeah, you have. All, it's, it's in red wine. So, so resveratrol. So red, resveratrol is in red wine. It, ha, it, has, it has a target on a very specific histone deacetylase. And, um, and so it has uh, an effect. And so if you give mice resveratrol, if you just give them resveratrol, then they live longer. So that's kind of a cool thing. And, uh, and so, but you know, for, for me to give Rusty the same amount of resveratrol, you'd have to drink about two cases of red wine uh, a day. <laughs> the, Which means you're gonna have to cut it in half, you know. <laughs> It's all over. It's, it's throughout. It's throughout the body. So it's targeted for an enzyme, but not for a cell or not for an organ. So, so. Is there any other questions? But the cancer therapies are coming. They are targeted. Yeah. Well, well, the cancer therapies are. Um, what what we know is that when we give certain of these cancer therapies, that we can reactivate, for example, the p53 or the Rb gene because we know that those, are methyl, that those are inhibited by methylation. And so we, there are demethyl, you can, active, you can suppress the methylases. So, so let me just, it's a little technical, but it's kind of fun to think about it. 
At least it's kind of fun for me to think about. <laughs> so here's this strand of DNA. It's double-stranded, right? And so when a gene, when a site is methylated, in fact, both strands are methylated, okay? And, and so now I'm going to block the demethylase because when, you, when this divides and I make two new strands, what it does, it comes back and methylates. If the C was already methylated, it, it remethylates it on both strands. Now, if you block the demethylase, when it divides, now only one strand is methylated and the, and the new daughter strand is not methylated. And then let's do it again. Or you do it again, now only one and four strands are methylated. So in other words, by, by block, continuing to block the methylase, you can dilute out the methylation that's occurred on that C. And, and what happens is we know that those two genes, the RB and P53 genes, that are the gatekeeper genes, we know that they're controlled by methylation. So by demethylation, you can, you can open those up, and then all the cancer cells that were allowed to continue to survive, they, they, they'll be allowed to die. They just die a natural death. They just, they, they undergo programmed cell death. So, Candy. I'm curious about this picture on page five. So, environment influences processes. Whether or not somebody takes vitamins is not environment. It's their choice to take vitamins. Right, absolutely. So, what is the... You're talking about the mice. Yeah, yeah. about the mice. So this is really, so this is, is an interesting part of the thing that I haven't talked to you about. So on, on this, this was, uh, this study was done by a friend of mine at Duke, Randy Jertel. And, uh, and he and I spent five years talking about this experiment. And uh, because I was, um, my early, uh, my early, my earliest scientific career, I was at NIH. <clears throat> and, uh, and we cloned a whole cluster of genes. And, and in, in addition to the cluster of genes, these are the genes that make hemoglobin, we discovered a bunch of things in between the genes that people called junk DNA at the time. Now, I was always deeply offended by that, but <laughs> that they would call these things that I discovered junk DNA. Well, it turns out they're not junk DNA. Uh, they're repetitive DNA that occurs throughout the genome and it helps control uh, a lot of things about the genome. So, but I also studied methylation and, uh, and we were studying that as a way of turning off genes. So Randy and Jertle and I, uh, he and I would talk about this a, a lot. He was studying imprinting, uh, which is a in interesting, and I was kind of an expert in methylation. And so the two of us worked, worked together. So this wasn't my work. But it was his work. But it was. But I was. I listened to him. His ideas about this, and so these mice are called agouti mice, and agouti is the coat color. It's a, and I don't know exactly what agouti means, but it's it's a it's a color. Uh, I'm limited to my eight basic colors because that was the size of my Crayola pack when I was in the third grade. So so these other colors, I you know, if there's variation and all, I don't do that. But agouti is a color that I don't know. But these mice, these agouti mice, are uh, what they found was that um, that there was a there, these there's a, a a part there's an, a, a gene that gets in there. It's called the agouti gene, and uh, and he reasoned that if there was a way of suppressing this gene, that you might be able to turn off the agouti gene and and create the normal coat color. And so, so one of the things, the, there's a couple um, chemicals that are required to create methyl groups. That is to create this methyl cytosine. Turns out that the methyl donors are vitamin, you know, vitamin B12, uh, folic acid. So these are things that, um, that, that are, are essential. So when he treated the mothers, when he treated the mothers of these mice with these vitamins, and then they had their babies, the babies had a normal coat color rather than the mutant coat, coat color. And, and then he went in and looked to see why, and he found out that, <clears throat> that it was because this agouti gene was methylated and suppressed. So it was, it was one of the first, and really, are you okay? 
It was okay. Yes. So it was one of the really, it was one of the first examples that by methylation you could have a pr profound effect on an outcome across generations. So, uh, and that's why I showed you this. And you, and you can go to the, you can Google this. It's been described, you know, it's been commented on many, many times. It's very interesting. Um, and for me it was exciting because I had a chance to sit with Randy and we would, we would usually sit over coffee and talk, talk about these mice. And, uh, and so I frequently refer to it. So once again though, it's a transgenerational thing. It wasn't treating the mice. It was treating the mother. And then the mother had these mice that, were, that, were, that had a different coat color. So I hope I've you know, disturbed your thoughts enough this morning that you'll think about the world in a, maybe, maybe in a different way. And, um, uh, but, I, but for me, this is fun to think about these things. And, uh, and so I only talk to you about things that I think are fun for me to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but, uh, but some of you, will, you know, might be interested in even now going to the, you know, going to the web and learning more about epigenetics. And, um, and I've only given you just a tiny, tiny bit of, the, of all of the epigenetic stories. But, I, but these are the ones, these three stories I think you can remember. And, uh, and I, think I think we're going to hear more about them. So, so thank you for coming out today.